and uh, I think we should be live and I have scheduled a tweet to go out in about a minute so yay you're so so prepared. that's happening and uh yes welcome to uh June's Stitch and Beach we are talking about all things We are talking about all things books, uh, all things crafts, and uh, sharing our crafting endeavors this uh, this time. Um, we should probably introduce ourselves in case there is, there are new people uh, joining us. So I am Reya, and my channel is The Book Finch. I have been on a little bit of a hiatus, uh, still continuing because summer summer is fun and all. <laughs> um, I normally talk about you know fantasy uh, and science fiction and also especially in comic and manga format and uh, Rachel how about you go next oh uh, yeah my re name is Rachel and my channel is Colinati I'm uh, semi-retired from booktube at this point <laughs> uh, so I'm not really active on YouTube anymore but I am on Instagram as Colinati as well and I read a lot of books, fantasy, science fiction, nonfiction, and currently I am, you know, absolutely obsessed with fiber arts. So yeah, that's all I want to talk about. <laughs> and Kelsey? I'm Kelsey. I am the Fancy Hat Lady Reads on YouTube and on TikTok. Um, and this, this here is Jammy, who wanted Jamie. to be our first cat sighting of yeah. the live stream. She showed up right on time. Absolutely, you know, prompt. Uh, <laughs> and um, I read a lot of fantasy and science fiction. I talk about it on the internet. Oh, and um, were we introducing our crafts or not yet? Not yet. Just introductions for now. And I? Hi, my name's Diana. My channel's Bookish Die, and I also read a lot of science fiction and fantasy and nonfiction. And I should finally have a video going up this week after some editing issues. And then we can talk about all of the things we are making. Does Rachel want to start? Somebody else should go first. <laughs> oh, go first. no, I'm, in, I'm in, crocheting another triceratops. I, I still need to crochet the first one. Yeah, I brought I brought Flora home because she needs some repair to her legs. I did not stuff her properly, so she's been just sort of squishing on my <laughs> desk oh. at work. Um, but yes, I love making these. Um, African flower motif stuffed toys. Um, it's really fun and it's a great way to use up little bits of sock yarn. Um, so that is what I am doing with this kind of brown blue version as well. It's beautiful. I feel like I missed, I did not know you were making triceratopses. Is there, is there a story? Uh, not really. I made Flora almost exactly a year ago. I choose my uh, Has it also all has it been a year already? It has been. It has been. Yes. Yep. Ridiculous. What is time? I know. <laughs> um, Kelsey, how about you? I am still working on the same sewing skirt. I'm sewing trim onto this skirt, exactly the same project I was last time. I've made no progress since last month. Honestly, I probably wouldn't wouldn't have ever gotten around to this at all if we're, if it were not for the Stitch and Bitch live streams. So, like, this is these live streams are the only reason I am ever going to finish this project. Peer pressure does mm. help. Well, make sure you get it done. <laughs> yeah. Die. So I am still working on this shawl. I think I'm in the, I think, I need to take stock of yarn, but I think I'm in the last repeat of the mosaic pattern for now. And then it's garter stitch, then um, tying off. But yeah, still work. I Because it's getting so long, I just kind of do a couple of rows at a time. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I am drawing something. It, uh, hopefully, it will be a Midsummer Night's Dream type of puck thing. Um, so we shall see. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm 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 drawing my me- my mental capacity. It's too hot. That's the reason. I I can't I can't have handle anything yarny with my sweaty palms, and it's like 28 degrees Celsius in my apartment. Which for you Fahrenheit people out there, it's like in the 80s or so. Uh, yeah, that's I think closer to 90. Yeah, yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's the joys of living in an old building. That has no built-in air conditioning, but is very, very well insulated oh, for winter. <laughs> Completely backfires during summertime. <laughs> so, um, now that we have talked about uh, our crafting endeavors, what is everybody reading? Is there anyone who wants to start first, or should I pass the ball to die who is next in the rotation i can start first so i god this month has been like up and down for because for a while i wasn't reading and then last weekend i ended up finishing i find i went back and reread Witchmark, and last weekend i finished that trilogy which i really enjoyed um and then i like devoured a bunch of kate daniels books because they're super easy for me to read and then Sorry, I'm looking at my shelves. And then now I've switched to, because I started the month off with nonfiction. Like I read three nonfiction books in a row and now I'm reading another nonfiction. So um, I'm reading Jesus and John Wayne, which is all about um, white evangelicals. It So the full title is, let's see. Let's see that's a combination. Jesus and John Wayne. So it, <laughs> yeah. So it's called Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. So I had heard about it from a few different places. And in June, I ended up watching like three different documentaries where the author was interviewed. So it was like the two Hillsong documentaries, one on Hulu, one on HBO Max, or on Max. I hate that stupid name change. And then the Duggar family documentary on Prime, Shiny Happy People. Oh, yes, that. Um, but if I, the if I author never have to was hear inter- about Duggars. It uh, but the author was interviewed because her specialty, like her research specialty is white evangelicalism. Yeah. And so I was like, I was interested in like finally reading her book and my library had a copy. I'm not super far in, I'm like in chapter two. Um, I can go next. Um, I'm currently reading Fool's Errand by Robin Hobb, finally starting the Tony Man uh, trilogy and also continuing my uh, Summers of Robin Hobb uh, tradition because I read, I have pre- basically read all of her books during summer months, like Live Ship Traders. I read, I think, not last year, but the year before that, like in two weeks, read the entire trilogy. So now let's see if I can manage to do the same hat trick with Tony Man. Been enjoying so far. I'm only about like 150-ish pages in so far, and I have already cried once. So this is going well. And then I have a bunch of comics that I need to read because I need to return them to the library, including the next volumes of Chainsaw Man. And uh, then uh, I also borrowed from the library a couple of books by Cat Sebastian. So that's so very that, exciting. So that, so that uh, gay romance is happening. <laughs> which okay, one? Which ones do you have out? Which ones do you yeah. have out? Yeah. Oh, damn it. I can't, I can't remember. So I'm just going to grab them quickly. Yeah, next, them. Pers- next person can tell about the reading yeah. in the meantime has the has yeah. a new a new book i have that one checked out my hold's expiring in three days so i have to ah. like start and finish it i haven't i haven't got a copy i'm i'm at a point now where i just need to auto pre-order like everything by cat sebastian and everything by kj charles <laughs> so basically i have the lawrence brown affair that one's fun 
And I have and I have the ruin oh, of a rake. The princess is fighting you. <laughs> yeah, these the princess are, these are the two. Rebel princess. <laughs> and these yeah, are the two cat Sebastians I have, basically. Okay. Okay. I will say my favorite is the queer principles of Kit Webb. And that's because one, it's not Regency, it's Georgian. So you get like all the ridiculous descriptions of the clothes that they wore because Georgian mm -hmm. Georgian clothing was like so ostentatious and over the top. And yes. two, it is essentially be gay, do crime, dismantle the nobility. And it is yes. the best. <laughs> as one does, as one does. But yeah, like it is, it is one of the first, like one of the few historical romances that I've read that like explicitly talks about like how the British nobility got their money and kind of like gets into the ethical stuff around that and is like, maybe this shouldn't exist. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> yes, I like where you're going, Cat Sebastian. Yeah, I mean, I, I basically went to the library and was like, what do I want to read? I'm in the mood for something fluffy and cute and romantic. Mm -hmm with like especially to offset the tragedy that is going to be the Tony Man trilogy I need some you know serotonin and dopamine did you so, ever read Hither Page no I haven't these are the first Cat Sebastians that I have uh, that I have ever picked up and I picked them up because they were available at the library because I was browsing shelves and I was like mm -hmm. hey Cat Sebastian I, I know, know people who have read these yeah I don't know how um the miss or hither page and missing page maybe they're like self-published ebooks or something they maybe. are they are yeah yeah they're self-published and i would say they're less like romance and more of like historical mysteries like there is a yeah. very strong romantic element but the romance isn't central the same way it's that it important. is yeah it's important but it's not the the yeah the like story, with yeah. the lawrence brown affair and like ruin of the rake for example like the main drama of it is the romance and like there are other mm -hmm. things going on but it's mostly the romance between the characters whereas with yes. hither page and i forgot the second one um <laughs> missing page missing page, missing yeah. page it's more like there's other things going on Mm -hmm. that have equal both narrative are, weight both to the of romance. Them are very queer though and the second one missing page the the mystery in that i thought it was great just the 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 answer to the mystery i was like yeah yeah same <laughs> yes so so that is it that is it for me that, that those are mine um rachel do you want to go first uh, next um yeah thing things read uh ray and i read a house with good bones one of the few books that i finished this month actually <laughs> i was just checking my goodreads i think i've read like maybe four books since our last live show um but we did read a house with good bones by um t kingfisher um ursula vernon which it's a horror novel but i did not think it was nearly as creepy as like um the Twisted Ones, and what was the other? Hollow Places. Hollow Places, yeah. Um, I did find it very funny, and I liked that the the main character was an an, ent an entomologist, basically, but yeah. worked in archaeology. Um, so I thought, thought that that was really fun. It was a very, very Ursula Vernon type of novel. If you followed her at all in the past couple of years, you'll be like, well, this was taken directly from your conversation with this person on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I thought that it was it was fine. Um, not necessarily something that I will be think like for example T Kingfisher's Nettle and Bone is something that's been kind of occupying my brain space rent free since that since I read it mm -hmm. and the same thing happened with like the hollow places where I was thinking about it quite a bit after I finished it because there was some there was some like visual imagery because I'm a very mm -hmm. visual reader that in that book that really stuck with me and I don't think that this one had that no, it didn't. I mean, there were some creepy scenes where like, oh, I wouldn't want to be touched by that while I was sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> but 
But it was more, more like the like the most visual element of the story. I think was the Confederate painting that sort of stuck with yeah. me. Yeah, because for some reason that was mentioned. So also, like, I really don't want to go pulling out old family photographs and looking too closely at the background. Yeah. Um, or 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 if you have like Civil War era uh, photos, like don't want to look too closely at the uniforms. Uh, I've some Civil uh, War era photos in my family, but most of them are just studio portraits. So mm. yeah. Um, so we read that. That was fun. And I the other like really big thing that I read, I mean like a big book that I read was Infinity Gate by M. R. Carey. And I'm completely out of the loop on book two and what people um <laughs> are saying about that book. Um, I've never read, read anything by M.R. Carey before. I think he's been a little bit more like fantasy horror, maybe. Um, like the girl with all the gifts. And I was never interested in those. But Infinity Gate is like a multiverse AI story. And it really hooked me at first. Um, and then it was just very long. <laughs> I think the story is supposed to be about how an artificial intelligence awakens and, and like takes down this multiverse empire called the Pan Pandominium. But the whole this whole book is just the backstory of the like human characters that led to events happening. And I'm like, can we get to the bit where the AI actually starts doing something? <laughs> I did I did like it though. Um, whoever the narrator was of the audiobook was really good. Um, and a lot of it, most of the story takes place in different versions of Lagos, actually, which was really interesting. I thought the setting of the novel was was really cool. Um, so we'll we'll see if I continue with that series because it's gonna be like a trilogy or something. And right now, what I'm currently reading, um, I'm continuing with the Hat Shop Mysteries, uh, that series. I'm on number five now. It's called Assault and Beret. And it is still very fun and ridiculous. It's just cozy, cozy mystery. So um, I like it. And there are a lot of ridiculous hat descriptions. So fun. And close my tabs. The ridiculous hat descriptions sound really good. It's good. You know, I wish that the covers of the books took more inspiration from the actual descriptions in, in the text because the book covers are just these very like generic stock images of, you know, plain cloches and stuff. And I'm like, no, there's, you know, the whole custom hats for like the Mad Hatter and everything. <laughs> Um, and then there are two things I am working on right now. I've restarted the art and science of Ernst Haeckel. Um, Haeckel was a scientist who is known for his really fantastic illustrations of itty bitty ocean life, as how, as how I'm going to describe it. And um, this is a collection of some of his really famous pieces and then like a, his kind of like a biography and stuff. So it'll go fast once I get to the second half, which is all of the images. But yeah, it's a very, very pretty book. And then, because everybody knows that I'm obsessed with weaving, um, I was recently in Colorado and got to go to a couple of really awesome yarn shops. I went to lamb spun in fort collins and uh the loopy U in loveland i think and they're both awesome i didn't realize until i actually went there that they were super well-known shops and lamb spun had like the most amazing book collection i could have walked out with one of each but i limited myself to just two and one of them is the enigma of shadow weave illuminated which Oh, niche, but um, I mean, look at that! Oh, wow! Oh, it's wow! Really awesome. So this is another one that it's just got like absolutely gorgeous photographs in it. 
And I'm learning about shadow weave, which don't ask me to explain it. I'm not that far into the book. <laughs> and that is pretty much it for me. I have not been doing a lot of consistent reading aside from my buddy read with Rhea this month. Um, I've just been busy with other things, I guess. I guess well, the older you get in life, you suddenly find out that uh, there are things that you start to prioritize or that you find that other things take precedence. And that, that is a scary thing. I'm, I'm, I'm used to not having that. <laughs> Yep. Kelsey, do you want to talk about your reading next? Yes. So I had two pre-orders that arrived this month. And my my goal when I pre-order books is that I, I want to believe their things. I will pick up and read immediately upon their arrival, which does not always happen. But I uh, did read... Witch King by Martha Wells, like the moment it arrived. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm still thinking of, about it. Um, it's, and, and I said this on Goodreads, it's very clearly the book that Martha Wells wrote after watching The Untamed. <laughs> yeah, I saw the description of the book and like I've never seen The Untamed, but I like know the premise. And I'm like, wait a minute, is this Untamed fanfic? And, and not in the romance sense, because there's not really a romance or anything in it. And but in terms of the two timelines, and like what's going on with the politics in the two timelines, and you know, the character who is back from the dead at the beginning of the present timeline is like very, very um <laughs> it's it's one of those books where there's like so much in it that you know it feels like there should be more in this world but it does it does work as a standalone um it left me feeling bittersweet emotions i i recommend it if you like denser fantasy I'm looking uh, forward to this then. I just got my copy from the library, so. I, my cop, hold on. I'll be right back. My copy from Illumicrate arrived and I don't think Ooh, I showed you guys it. One. Oh, do show. I'm thinking my puck is getting inspiration from the hot Lucifer statues a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it's like not as pretty as some of the books that Illumicrate has done, but like, look at these Ooh. edges. Oh, nice. Like it's the same cover, but like you got edges, you got- you end pages. Yeah, we got foil mm. on the hardcover. And then- Oh, that's nice. That's Whoa, I, I need to get a, a better look at that. I'm I'll sure send you guys some photos. I'll send you guys some photos once we're done. And then okay. this is end page number wow. two. Ooh, wow. Ooh, nice. How, so, yeah. how do you think, Kelsey, how do you think it compares to like other works by uh, Martha Wells? So I've only read Murderbot, even though I own a bunch of her other fantasy novels ah. because I'm terrible at getting to things. Um, I, I have heard, having not read The Witch King, I have heard that it leans more towards the tone of the Roxora books. Okay. I can definitely tell that it's the same author as Murderbot. Um, and I did I did start reading the first Roxora book at one point, and then it, w it wasn't what I wanted to be reading right then, and I, I put it aside for later. So like, I can, I, I have a bit of a sense of what her writing is like in those. Um, it's, I see a lot of Murderbot fans who are disappointed in Witch King, and I, like, I'm not one of those. Um, for me, this is a book that's much more 
aimed towards the sort of things I normally gravitate to towards reading, whereas Murderbot was actually a very hard sell to get me to read it based on that premise. Mm -hmm. It was a book that I, I had to have shoved at me hard by word of mouth because otherwise I would not have picked up a book called The Murderbot Diaries with that cover. Um, whereas this is something that I, I would have picked up on my own regardless, I think. So I think I was more primed to like it than other Murderbot Martha Wells readers uh, have been because it's it's honestly more the thing I would normally read than Murderbot is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is, is understandable. It, it just has this incredibly rich world building that it's that trusts you to figure it out as you go it doesn't stop to do exposition or explanation on how any of it works mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and like there's there's a lot of different magic stuff going on um but there is enough information if you're paying attention closely to figure it all out. Okay. But it's a book that you have to read closely to figure to figure mm -hmm. everything out. Okay. I think, I think I've been kind of worried that it's going to strike me the same way that Anne Leckie's fantasy novel did. What was that called? Um, Raven the Raven Tower. Tower which I, the Raven Tower. I, have, I loved The Raven Tower. That's like <laughs> one of my favorites. It's one where, like, there are still some things about that book that stick in my head that were just really interesting to try to figure out. But at the same time, the whole, it just never quite gelled for me. I got to the end of that book and just thought, well, this was different, but I'm not sure it worked for me. And I think, I, I think what I hear was that was, that was like the transition from sci-fi to fantasy or something. And Yeah. I will say having seen The Untamed and having that as like a plot parallel roadmap in my brain while reading Witch King it gave me maybe a little more context that some other people reading this book might not have. So I sort of picked up on, on that parallel right at the beginning and was like, oh, I see where this is going. <laughs> I see, like I wonder... I should try Untamed again, but I could never get past the first two episodes. <laughs> yeah, episodes make if it's no seven, sense until you've watched the next 30 episodes. You just have to get to the flashbacks. If I'm it's, any, if it's any consolation, you Rachel. You the first two episodes up until the point in episode two where the flashback starts. You can just start with the flashback and then go mm. back and watch the first two episodes in chronological order. <laughs> Rachel, if it's any consolation, you might try the books instead because those have been translated now uh, and the official translation from what I understand is pretty good. I personally DNF'd the, the first book. Uh, I couldn't after... get into, I, I tried reading the fan translation and I got a little ways into the beginning and couldn't really get into it. But I always have a hard time reading source material for stuff after I've already seen an adaptation. I don't know why it's mm -hmm. weird. Um, in, in terms of like, I I think it's like very like simplistic the sort of it material is. It, it is. So it might be. They easier added if... a lot of stuff for the show that I actually really like. Like they developed the female characters a lot more for the show. Of course, because they had to censor the all the gay stuff from the books. Right, but they didn't. They didn't like make any of the female characters a love interest for either of the two main leads. But like, yes, I, I know, I know they didn't because I've seen the show. But it's like you, right. you have to have like a female presence because otherwise the male friendships they, start to look real damn suspicious. <laughs> but like, I really like all of the all of the the stuff that they gave Wen Ching and everything. So I don't know. Um, I, I watched, I never watched the final season of the Donghua, but I watched the first two seasons, which I think is more faithful to the web I mean, novel I mean, than the live action. And 
it made some things make more sense, but also I didn't like it as much. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I will say that I am in the definite minority that I did not like Untamed that much, and I don't didn't like the Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation, which is the sort, sort, source material, that much either. Like, I mean, I, I appreciate it's that like other people life. like it. I I think if I watched it now for the first time, having watched like objectively better C dramas, I would also maybe not like it as much. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, that I will my... never know. I will never yeah. know. I mean, I, I think that my my problem, like my problems with it mostly are the fact, like I mean, I I've seen so much, like anime, K-drama, C-drama, like, like the, uh, so the, um, sort of tropes and plot catalogs that I, I, I already have from watching all of these shows and stuff and reading a bunch of like webtoons and all of that, it starts to feel a little derivative mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I've, I've had so much exposure to other things that are similar. So it didn't like, whereas I know for a lot of people, Untamed was like one of the first easily available C-dramas that they we're watching. So I definitely like Yeah, why don't did want to take it away from people. Why did the untamed blow up so much? Is it just availability or something? Well, first of all, I mean, first of all, it was available in Netflix uh, oh. pretty pretty early on. Mm -hmm. So that so that boosted its popularity. There were, I mean, but there also been it, other C dramas on Netflix before then, but if I go back now and like try to watch any of them that were on Netflix before them, the subtitles are so atrocious that it's impossible to watch them. Yeah, um, I, I'm. I mean, I was a, and thinking like also that it was very popular for the net for the Untamed are also atrocious, but you can still figure out what's going on. There's also the fact that it was it was pretty like like phenomenally successful in in the chinese market as well so that also like just a lot was, of buzz for it there was so much buzz for it and it got fan translated so much and then eventually like picked up for official licensing and stuff because of the fan like buzz a, a buzz around it mm -hmm. i mean it's hard to say why that series in particular um was the one that like got all of the attention I think, honestly, like, part of it also had to do with the appeal of the queer romance, which is obvious, even in the censored version. And just like how, how much certain demographics of fans want to see that. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I can't find my scissors. Anyways. So, so I read Witch King. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Um, I finished The Moth Keeper last night, which I thought was beautiful, but I it didn't like grab me the same way that the Tea Dragon books did, which is just very, very personal and, you know, very um hold on i'm i've got thread going on here <laughs> um it's just a very 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 personal thing like the the there was nothing in it that like made me so wildly wow enthusiastic is just like the concept of tea dragons but it has the same sort of character work mm -hmm. that yeah. uh, Hay O'Neill's other books have. That's lovely. It has gorgeous art. I'm a little confused about the fantasy biology of this magic tree and the moths. Um, four stars. And then uh, what I'm actually reading right now is my 
second pre-order of the month that I started reading as soon as it came, but then put it aside and I'm now reading it again. I'll probably finish it this evening and that's Mortal Follies by Alexis Hall, another queer romance writer. But this is uh, his first fantasy romance. So like, I'm not interested in reading romance that's not speculative <laughs> because I just can't convince myself to care. So uh, this is um, Regency sapphic romance fantasy. And this ties in, Rhea, with your Midsummer Night's Dream art because oh. the narrative device in this is that the narrator of the book is Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream who oh. has um, been spying on mortal follies throughout the centuries and has stories to tell. And I mean, that sounds uh, like a Puck thing to do. Interesting. Exactly, exactly. Um, and uh the the premise is that he's been like kicked out of oberon's court for reasons that have not been specified and he's trying to like make a living in the mortal world and like selling romance novels to <laughs> oh my god i want to read this <laughs> which is delightful and like part of I, me i kind of want to read this now too <sighs> Loves it was on my radar, but I never so read the description. But it's not, I'm like, I'm not sure it's actually working for me from a romance perspective to have like that outside narrator as opposed to actually being in one of the characters like POV. So I'm I am kind of on the fence about it right now. Um, the second half though is feeling very different from the first half because there's something that happens halfway through that like changes things dramatically so um i i my i do not yet have a real verdict on this book yet uh speaking of puck here is how he is progressing definitely getting inspiration from the hot <laughs> lucifer <Yeah. laughs> it's the teeth the canines are coming out and everything <laughs> But also I wanted to challenge myself because I have not drawn male characters in a long time. Like it's been probably years at this <laughs> point. I think the last one was my Spider-Man drawing from like the year 20... 21? <laughs> Let's see. I'm, let me check and see if I if I forgot to mention anything. Oh, the other thing I've read this month was The Sunbearer Trials by Aidan Thomas, which I did not read Cemetery Boys because I like started it and I was like, this is too contemporary for me. I need like real fantasy. Um, <laughs> and I kind of loved the characters, but hated the premise of some bearer trials. I'll have more to say about it in a wrap up, I'm sure. So has everyone had a chance to talk about the reading? I mm -hmm. know that Di, Di, Di mentioned her reading as well. So I think we've all touched upon what we have been reading. Um, so let's take a little a uh, moment to look at who's here. So Joe, as usual, is here. Hello, Joe. Never missing a uh, live stream. And Ron is here as well. Hello, hello. And uh, Ron loved Raven Tower, which I haven't read it. Should I read I Raven know, Tower? Yeah, right so here's the here. thing. I think with Raven Tower, what helped me as well as like why I didn't mind the ending was that it's Hamlet. Right. It is I, fantasy I Hamlet. heard so many reviews of that book and no one mentioned it was Hamlet. And then someone said it was Hamlet on TikTok. And I'm like, now I need to read it. It's Hamlet? It's a yeah, Hamlet. It's Hamlet. Going, I have been told. The, the main character, our narrator, is um, Horatio, 
My and the prince that they Hamlet. serve is Fantasy Hamlet. Interesting. I would never have made that connection. <laughs> Interesting. See, that's the reason I need to. I, need to, I, I do enjoy Hamlet. I bad reviews when it came out. And then someone on TikTok, out of nowhere, recommends it on a list of Shakespeare retellings. And I'm like, wait. <laughs> Yeah, it's Hamlet. <laughs> I need to. So someone, someone on TikTok made an actual good take. Yes, yes. There are there are people on TikTok doing actual good takes. They're not necessarily the people going viral, but you, if you work hard, you can find them. Yeah. Oh my God. So speaking of bad TikTok stuff, um, I'm so glad I'm not on that fucking clock app because I could not handle all the fourth wing hype because that book is awful have I, did i mention fourth wing yes last really? month yes last i think you did yeah. I, I think we had an it's excellent terrible. Rant about it, it is like it keeps showing up on my instagram discover page and i've had to like block it and it's still getting through and of all like the mediocre like it's not even it, of all the terrible fantasy romances and like the current drama is that it came out that rebecca yaros is a active mormon and so someone was talking about that. And then another book talker did a sub talk. It's like, oh, I'm so excited for this inclusive community. Oh, except for like when it's religion and people are like, okay, this is not the take that you think it is. Um, I am not touching um, religious topics with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. Because but anyway, uh, pe do people, not recommend people fourth who are um... fourth, fourth wing is my anti rec for this year. It, it is just a bad book. Yeah, I, 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 let's put it this way. When you were uh, describing it last time, I was con continuously going like, yeah, this sounds like exactly the type of book that will forever push me away from enjoying reading. <laughs> yeah, I will say, like, I do think that this book was reverse engineered based off of tropes that TikTok likes. Oh, um, and then it wasn't even done well. That isn't, I don't think that is a good way to approach any type no. of creative. Like, creative I don't, I don't have art. that as like, it's not something I, like, they've specifically said, but like the enemies. But you get the to, vibe. Yeah, yeah, like the enemies to lovers, the ambiguously brown a uh, potential man of color who's basically just like a copy paste of the romantically from the Akatar series. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Dragons, because bitches love dragons. I mean, bitches love dragons, but like. I mean, do, I, like, I am bitches. I love dragons. Just, and I will say, like, the dragon was the best part of this damn, of that damn book, but that is damning it with faint praise. <laughs> Yes, let's start using anti rec more because this is a, this is a good word. Ramsey is completely correct. Yeah. Um, so, what type of media have we been enjoying since we talked last time? Ooh, Kelsey, do you want to start? Am I enjoying any media? Any media, music, uh, movies, series, anything you want to talk about? Oh, I mentioned this to you guys or some of you yesterday when we were talking, but um, I saw uh, in theaters, because there's a movie theater that Netflix owns in New York that's showing it, the adaptation, animated adaptation of Nimona that's coming to Netflix at the end of the month and i enjoyed it i think i think i maybe need to reread the graphic novel to remember like what all they changed because i feel like most of the plot is changed um there's but it it's I don't know. I, I, I want to reread the graphic novel and I want to watch it again once it's on Netflix. And yeah, I will I'll say, I think it. I've heard that they've changed a lot from the graphic novel. Yes. What I, what I, my 
tentative uh, verdict is, is that it's one of those adaptations that changes like almost all of the actual details of the plot, but still has the same like vibes and hits the same sort of emotional beats. Hmm. Um, I liked it. Uh, but I think I, I'm not sure I have like especially articulate things to say. Um, <laughs> I also went to see um, uh, the live action Little Mermaid. Oh. And it's, it's also, it, it, here's the thing. I don't think I would have been able to totally sit through it if I were watching it at home on my laptop on Disney Plus. Like I could feel the bits where like, yes, that was the end of the great musical number. Now we go back to like boring scenes where I would pause and like go do something else and forget I was watching the movie <laughs> and I was watching it at home. <laughs> I kind of I kind of want to see it, but like it's not a priority, especially because uh, Across the Spider-Verse is showing in theaters right now and I have yet I to see it to and see I it. want to go. That I want a hundred percent see that in theaters. It is yeah, I am phenomenal. definitely going. I, I have the, a the only reason I, have a ticket. I went to see Little Mermaid instead of spider versus because it was showing at the movie theater right near me that had like that's it's a small like three screen theater so they only show a few movies at a time and um they have cheap matinee tickets and i'm a member so i get member point whatevers <laughs> um but i think you know, the funny thing, I remember they first announced that they were doing this back when I was like in college, uh, live action Little Mermaid. And I remember having conversations with college friends where everyone was like so extremely dubious that they could make the singing fish work for like under the sea or whatever. And I feel like they heard that that concern in the fan community and were like, we will make under the sea work. We will put everything into this musical number. <laughs> and then nothing went into the rest of the movie. <laughs> because <laughs> like so much effort was in part of your world and under the sea and like maybe poor unfortunate souls and like they were great. And then the rest of the movie is just there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, there are currently um, a few things that I'm excited about that I haven't been watching it, but that, like I'm excited about. Can you believe it? One Piece is getting a live action adaptation, and normally, I am very dubious about um, live action adaptations of any anime series because usually they getting... suck. One Piece is also getting an ice show in Japan, starring Shoma Uno, who is the world champion. In yeah, but that doesn't theater. surprise me because they have already <laughs> done like One Piece musicals and like matinees and reviews and all of that. So an eye no, show no, is this, just this like this the next probably step. probably doesn't surprise One Piece fans. This does surprise figure skating fans that like the, <laughs> the skaters involved in this show have chosen mm. to be involved in this show. <laughs> also, Ramsey, you are a braver person than I am for going to go see The Flash. That movie looks so bad. Yeah, I saw a trailer and I was like, yeah, that's one movie that I I'm never going to see. I am going to be forever salty that they shelved Batgirl and not The Flash because, like, with Batgirl, you could have gotten Michael Keaton back as Batman and you get Brandon Fraser involved. And, like, yeah, you don't have Ezra Miller. Yeah, and all but that you gotta have those fucker. tax breaks, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you tell that I didn't want to draw hands? So now he just has an <laughs> artful, sexy robe that covers every, um, like, every bit of his uh, difficult to draw body parts. <laughs> just, just makes it more suggestive. Yes. 
Um, so the only the only thing basically that I like I've been watching recently was uh, I went I I think I touched upon this last time, but I did went to see all of the Lord of the Rings movies, the extended cuts, in the theater, and it was a nice time. It was epic. <laughs> And then, obviously, we have been watching the second season of Shadow and Bone with uh, we, Rachel and Joe. We've decided we may not. Yeah, it's, so we're gonna try another episode or two, but it's it's yeah, not. It's, it's not throwing me in like the first season did. Yeah, the first season was fine. Like Ben Barnes is like carrying the show at this point, and he's 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 buckling under pressure. I don't think he's like. He's enough of a draw anymore to like bring he's, me in. He's got the most like magnetic, p- powerful character in the show. Yeah. So he, he's the presence that makes a lot of it work. I do think that um, Jesse May Lee, just Jesse May Lee, that's her name, right? Yeah, yeah that's the name. She plays yeah. Alina. And I think she's doing a much better job with this season. I feel like, yeah, in kind the of first matured season. And, and grown into the character a bit more. Yeah, um, I just don't understand her, like, the characters, Alina's romance with Mal. She, they're like, not giving any any individual character, even the leads, much to do. It's just jumping all over the place and you get these short scenes with a couple of people and nothing really progresses, nothing really happens. So... I, I will say that I think that they are utilizing the little that we've seen of her actually like nina's character mm. is actually a lot better in this this season than i was I mean, not a fan was. of of the nina fjerden storyline in the, the last season i think you and i were both just yelling at the screen whenever those characters were were there yeah well but, but that this is that- season nina is actually like getting stuff done with the crow club people i'm like they would be lost without you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the funny thing is, the funny thing is that if you look at it from an adaptational point of view, Nina's and Matthias' story is actually pretty well adapted, even in the first season. Uh, it's very, pretty close to the books, but also it was the Accurate, thing that I hated so a lot gross. in the books I don't as well. Like him, he is uh, just yeah, well, he's, he's a boring sexist pig. and prejudiced, and I, like I don't get it. Either. Yeah, he's 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 awful. In the books, okay, I haven't I haven't watched any of the show context. I did read the books. Yeah, well, um, let let's put it. I let's remember it... not liking almost like any of the romances in the Six of Crow duology. Like they paired everyone up by the end. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't ship any of it. <laughs> I think the closest I got to shipping was actually Kaz and Inej. No. Yeah, but the, in the I books, love... not not in the yeah. not in the show. Definitely not in the show. The show is just like the they have the in the show they have the chemistry of wet toast. I would say Inej deserves better than that guy. I don't. Yeah, understand but like Kaz's, I, I felt Kaz's that character. Way in the book that Inej deserved better, but. I mean, Inej deserves the world, but I liked her in Book Kaz. Yeah, like, like I, I feel like, and especially because, like, in the end of the books, she and Kaz are not necessarily together. They have kind of taken the first step in the direction where in the future they can be together because Kaz right. acknowledges that he has some major trauma yes. healing to do. Yeah, and so, like, they go, like, they spoilers for this like just for them like Inej gets a ship and she goes sailing but it's like the implication is like she'll return home to Kaz so it's not Mm. like they're together it's like they're still like Rhea said they're still figuring it out yeah but they've like taken that step and they're both like taking some time to like grow and heal as people before coming back together yeah I can understand and, that, especially if Kaz admits he's got some work to do on himself first. <laughs> yeah, and the the tension between them in the book specifically was very well done. Like you can like like especially because Kaz as a character in the books is so much is so 
well developed. Like I like that was the one thing that I really enjoyed in in the six of like Kaz as a character is really engaging mm-hmm. and interesting and and not a character like a, he's not a character type that I've often read about. Um, so that makes him interesting to follow. And they have just completely drained all of that out of him. In, in like it's it's like. Like comparing book cast to like the adaptation, the TV show cast is like if you go to a bar and you ask for like a really hearty, like a dark, like ale and someone offers you a Bud Light. Like that is the basically the, <laughs> the comparison, you are, your expectation and then what you get in reality and they don't mesh. Yeah. So we'll we'll see where Shadow and Bone season two takes us. We may decide it's not worth our time, but yeah. Well, after you guys shamed me into it last night, I did watch the first Sandman episode on Netflix. Oh, nice. I'm not totally convinced this is a show I would watch if I weren't being peer pressured into it. <laughs> It's okay. You don't. You don't have pressure. to like it. <laughs> it's okay. You can. You cannot like it. But I. It warms my it's heart that you like gave it a try. It's very lavishly produced. I'll give it that. It's just nothing in that first episode grabbed me. You know. The first episode does feel a little piloty. If that. If. You know yeah, what I mean. and it kind of sets up. Everything. Yeah, it's it's all about the setup. The two, the two best ones that I really liked. I mean, the okay, so the diner one is not bad. I just have a really hard time reading that storyline or experiencing that storyline again. Um, but the episode with all the historical flashbacks, yeah, I, I yeah. like that. Oh, with the char- oh. the character Hob, Hob, yeah, yeah, that was really good. And then there's the one with death. The whole the whole episode is just you know, brother and sister yeah, walking around talking. Yeah, that was that, also very good. Those those were really good episodes. Yeah. I also like the extra episodes, especially the one um, with, oh God, Calliope? Pe- oh, yeah. Yeah. Did, did they those change were... the story from the comic? I feel like there was some, there's something different they did with I think that the, story to update it. I think the uh, there was some things in the... Um, in, in terms of how the writer character was, like, used. Maybe. Oh, Rachel. A thing that I just remembered unrelated to Sandman that I keep forgetting to mention to you is that there is news on Joy of Life Season 2 they are officially filming. Oh. Yes. yes. <laughs> Not just a rumor this time, they're actually Not doing it. Not just a rumor, they are filming. There are like photos of actors in costume. Is there, have they said anything about how much of the cast is returning? So they've announced some of the cast. Um, let's see who's definitely returning. Um, the main character guy better be back. He's <laughs> definitely back. Okay. So is. Uh, his love interest, Lin Wan Er, so is uh, Haitang Duodo, is that where her name was? She's back. Um, some of the older guys are definitely back. Um, Emperor is back. Chen Ping Ping is back. Um, Second prince. Both of, both of the princes and both of the siblings, I think, are definitely back. Okay. Um, the only character I think they've actually announced that they've recast so far is um, Lin Wan Er's like martial arts friend, oh. who was a very minor character, and they've recast her. Everyone is assuming that they're recasting um, Xiao Zhan's role. Uh, what was his name? He was he was the guy who who did. The stabbing at the end. What was his name? Everyone, um, everyone is assuming Yan Bing Yun. Is that was his name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone is assuming they're recasting him because they haven't announced that he's back and he's 
gotten he's such a like, huge star uh, now, right? He's gotten too famous to do supporting roles anymore, but they haven't announced a replacement yet, as far as I know. And then they announced a bunch of new actors who are playing new characters who weren't in season one. I'm so excited for this. Wait, the Emperor is back, right? Yes. <sighs> I think. They couldn't have anybody else play the Emperor, though. He was just so... Right. <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you get a good actor, just bring them back, you know? Yeah. Like, I have definitely, like, some characters where I can't imagine anyone else playing that character. It's just been that there's been such a delay in getting the ball rolling on season two. It's been so many years that, like, people have moved on in their careers. And when did, it's... They, when did they film the first season? A long time ago. Like 2018, 2019, I think. Yeah, probably post. It was released in 2019, so they filmed it in 2018, yeah. maybe. Wow. Oh. Yeah, COVID probably like has been hindering a lot of production in China. COVID, yeah. and I think I think some of the actors just got really big and they couldn't, they were having scheduling issues as well. Right. Because so, the first I'm season sure. was so popular. Mm -hmm. that like people involved in it got famous so um, how long do you think we're gonna have to wait i don't know what the i have no idea because the sea drama industry is really unpredictable mm -hmm. um much much as i um am I'm, I'm enjoying your enthusiasm on joy of life die what have you been watching Sorry. God, I've been mostly watching like cooking stuff as well. So um, for folks who just joined, one thing I watched was like three documentaries about evangelical shit. So it was two Hillsong documentaries, one on Max and one on um, Hulu. And that was just because, I don't know, I was kind of in a weird mood. And then I watched Shiny Happy People, which is about sort of it uses the Duggars as a jumping off point to discuss um it's like the institute of uh, principles for basic living or something like that and it's basically this evangelical fundamentalist thing of like how to like raise your children how to raise your family that is incredibly abusive and also goes into kind of their like their plans to put people in power in like the courts and the legal system. Um, I also watched uh, the finale of Top Chef. Um, so Top Chef World All-Stars really enjoyed the season. Uh, the winner was not a surprise, but I was surprised by someone who made it to the final three because he was on the chopping block so many times and he just kind of like kept getting through because <laughs> someone al almost always had like a worse day than him. Um, and then Star Trek Strange New Worlds just started up. I haven't seen the most recent episode, but I really liked the premiere. Um, let's see. Oh, also Taste the Nation, hosted by Padma Lakshmi, is back for season two. So I've been slowly getting through that on Hulu because it's one where I like to like really savor it. So it reminds me a lot of Anthony Bourdain's shows. And it's really well done. And it also makes me miss Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> Yeah, Anthony Bourdain was a riot. He like, was so well, he was and so nice. he was good. And one of the things I really appreciate with Taste the Nation is like it's not just going to like restaurants. Like Padma will go and visit like someone's grandmother and like learn about the dish. And it also gets into the culture. Um, and it's not. And so like the recent the episode that I just watched was on Appalachia. Appalachia and it goes into like different food traditions there so like you have you she talks with a Cherokee woman about like indigenous food ways she meets with a former top chef contestant who's a black woman to talk about like black food traditions and Appalachia she talks with a white man to kind of go into like how um, vegetables were cooked or prepared to make sure that they lasted 
throughout the winter and like made use of what they could grow. So it's a, like, it's a really interesting show. And it's one, if you have Hulu, I really recommend watching. Oh, interesting. Um, I basically have been like, first of all, what been watching Skip and Loafer and uh, like the, uh, the anime is ongoing. I think it's gonna, going to end in a few episodes though, because I doubt that it's a 24 episode series, more like 13 episodes. And then there has been my love story with Yamada-kun at level 999 which is about these two characters, one who is a, like a pro gamer and uh, like a university student who's kind of a casual gamer and they meet up in this like MMO RPG and then fall in love basically. And I've been really invested in that series because the, the dynamic between the main characters, because the female lead is a total himbo, <laughs> but like a female himbo. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how, like, she's great. And uh, the um, other character is like uh, super, how do you say, like stoic and uh, is, isn't really like, like he's kind of like, if, if like, he's kind of, I would say autistically coded in a way, like he has a, like a, some of, some of those traits, uh, which makes it even, even better to like, um, it isn't ever addressed whether he is or is on the spectrum or not, but it's nice to see that he thrives and like has like these um like 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 a lot of his behavior like maps out pretty well to like aut autistic traits. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and uh, also both Ramsey and Mr. Orosuri have been talk have been saying Oshinoko, and uh, I haven't yet started watching Oshinoko, but it's on my list of things that I want to start watching. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, because like uh, people like people in my friend group have been uh, recommending it to me. And uh, what else? Oh, I watched almost the entirety of Under the Queen's Umbrella. I mentioned it last live stream and now I have finished the series and it was good would recommend if you if you like historical korean dramas um and you like a sort of assertive female main lead i would recommend under the queen's umbrella um and um yeah that's been pretty much it oh and i started watching suits because i got roped into watching it so now now i know the whole like where Me megan markle came from <laughs> So it's just okay, I guess. It's, it was it's a bunch of lawyers. It was one that I just because I watched a lot of USA dramas back in the day because that was the network it was on. Like I was a burn notice girly. I watched a lot of white collar. Like I watched USA dramas, but there was something about Suits just that didn't interest me at all. Yeah, I do love I do love burn notice though. Like I think. It should have ended after season five. Like the last two seasons were not good. Like it outstayed its welcome. But like seasons one through four are fantastic. Like it is Michael Weston, the main character, at one point says, Guns don't make you smart. Duct tape. Duct tape makes you smart. <laughs> and it's in the context of him like jury rigging someone, like jury rigging something uh, to scare some. It's great. I love Burn Notice. <laughs> My gosh, I haven't seen Burn Notice in ages. I think I watched like season one back in the day. Wow. Yeah. I know nothing back. of any of these series. Wow. Yeah. Um, Di will be happy to know that I'm almost done with Leverage season one. I have been binging it this weekend. I just have the the uh, the season finale to go. So I will finish Oh, that makes me so today. happy. Aren't they I, great? I've been really enjoying it. And so I'm watching it on the IMDb freebie thing. Yeah. And I was trying to watch it in the recommended order, not the broadcast order, but it kept bumping me to the wrong episode. And it was so confusing. So I can definitely say that when I went back and I was watching things in the proper order, oh my goodness. I think this is why I actually am liking it more this time because when I first tried to watch season one, I was watching it in the broadcast order and it's just all over the place and it messes up like the, the 
character relationship evolution. Yeah. So right. it's so much better in the proper order. There's a there's a broadcast order? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what happened Yeah, so what happened was they filmed it and if you have the DVDs like I do, um the way the episodes are presented on the DVDs are the way that it was supposed to air. So like there's an episode called the two horse job where you find out more about Elliot's past and in the, yeah. the proper, in the DVD order, it's like mid to late season one. Like it's after Elliot's started to trust the team a little more to let them in a little more. Whereas mm -hmm. in the broadcast order, it's like the third episode yeah. and it oh. makes no sense for and it I'm to be an episode. I'm pretty sure that that is where I stopped watching the first time because it was like we suddenly jumped way deeper into the characters' relationships and what they're doing. I'm like, wait, this makes no sense. Yeah. Like, this wasn't <laughs> yeah. Oh, so yeah, boy. I've been enjoying it. The only the only thing about season one that made me go, oh wow, this is 15 years old is the brown face episode. Yeah, and that that like I Whoa, love so they just did that. <laughs> yeah, I love so much about that episode, but like that just it's so bad. I mean, Rachel, do you remember our reaction to Farscape? Yeah. And the many instances of very um uh, let's put it this way, very uh, racially um insensitive ways of portraying different alien races. Usually well, that, by white the actors. Episode that was basically basically riffing on like Polynesian culture and even oh. like if you if you listen to the um the commentary tracks that the creators yeah. did on that one, even they are like, We hate this episode. We cringe so much when we think about it, we should never have made it. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's a like okay, it, I'm glad it's you a lot. It. But yeah, I'm so glad that you're enjoying Leverage and like, I love Sterling as the antagonist because, and this becomes more clear in his appearances later on, in another show, he would be the protagonist and the Leverage crew would be the antagonist. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen, so the, the actor who plays Sterling, I don't know if I've ever seen him play a good guy before. He played a bad guy in Firefly as well. Yeah, I would say the closest I like I think the closest I've seen him as a good guy was Romo Lampkin in BSG. And I don't that he, Oh my god, he was in BSG. It's like this whole era of television. That's the thing about watching a show that that's this old. Because season one is it's from 2008 it's 15 years old yeah it's like, airing my first year of college yeah and I'm like so 2007 2008 was about the time that i actually started watching some television shows regularly like i had access to them and so i just keep seeing all these actors and i'm like What's really fun yeah, is there's every like, show from this time period <laughs> there's like a certain era of vancouver of like 2000s shows where it's like because there a lot of shows were filming in Vancouver uh -huh. where like actors would like pop up so like Jensen Ackles for example yeah he was he was in Dark Angel which I have the DVDs it's like I love Dark favorite. Angel when it's I a was weird a favorite of mine. I need to rewatch it at some point I've but like I, Jen, Jen <laughs> I rewatched it a couple of years ago there were some really cringy moments, but I remember Dark Angel being the first thing where where I I think I've like like the first thing where I was I was I was questioning myself because I I was like weirdly attracted to both like Jessica Alba's character and also the 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 main love interest. Oh, uh, uh, like, Michael Weatherly's character. Yes, like both of these people are so attractive. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like he was in Dark Angel and then he was on Smallville and then he was on Supernatural or like Grace Park was on like a bunch of Vancouver shows before yes. she joined. But did PSG. you know that Jensen Ackles was in Days of Our Lives and Sweet Valley High as well? Because that yep. blew my mind. Oh, wow. Yeah, so 
What's also so weird tangent, but so in Battlestar Galactica, um, in season four, when they kill off Callie, it's a hundred percent she got sucked into Nixium and she's still like someone who will defend Keith Raniere. You oh, can't believe that. I was reading, she up got on that killed movie. off because she wanted to do that full time. Oh, really? God. yeah, because she was in the cult in the Nixium cult. Yeah, she was like full on recruiting stuff. I, I if think you she got like. I had no she idea like that she recently found out that that's yeah. what she was doing with her life after B BSG. And I'm like, what No, that's heck? why, that's like, that's that. why she got written off. I think Allison Mack, because she was off of Smallville for, like, the last few seasons. I think that was also part of it. Yeah. Yep. Wow. I, I kind of want to watch BSG again. I've never rewatched it. I've rewatched the original mini series that kind of kicked off the reboot a couple of times, but I've never gone back to watch the seasons. And part of that is because I hate the ending of the show, but I'm so afraid that if I go back and rewatch it, it's just not going to live up to like my nostalgia for it. Like it's going to be really dated. <laughs> I mean, that could be, but you will never find out unless you watch it. I know. I, I just hope that you won't have, a, like, a Farscape experience like I had. Like, because, I like, don't think it'd be quite like Farscape. Um, because I remember watching Farscape as a teenager and loving it, and then we watched it together, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, no. There are certain episodes I think that won't age well. Like I know there was an abortion episode that I think aged like milk. Um, and like, if I do rewatch, I straight up refuse to watch Black Market again because that was one of the worst episodes in that show. Did I didn't love the episode, but the music from that particular episode I really liked. Oh yeah, the music for Black Market is fantastic. The episode itself is atrocious. Yeah. There were a couple also... years of my life that I just pretty much only listened to Bear McCreary's BSG soundtracks. So, like, there's still there's still some of my favorites. Yeah, I mean, it, the soundtracks are fantastic. Yeah. So so far, the only shows that I really like um, that, like, it's it's weird. Some some shows kind of lived up, but I changed my view on a certain like certain characters, um, and and like for example, SG One Stargate loved that show growing up watched it again uh, as an adult uh, like like a couple of years ago and i loved it still like it there were some of the episodes like cringy and like um let's let's just put it this way highly inflammatory yes but at the same time tialk is still my boy and <laughs> i i love christopher judge and uh, I will continue standing SG1. Yeah, but I will say, so going back to leverage. So season one is like when they're kind of like generally like angry and frustrated at capitalism. Season two is where you can like, because they filmed season one like just as the financial crisis was starting. So like, unless you were like really paying attention, you weren't seeing like all the foreclosures or like mm -hmm. what was going on with the subprime mortgages. But they started filming season two, I think in 2008, like after the financial crisis. And season two is when they like are absolutely fierce. Like the first episode is about bank bailouts. And I can't wait to get to this. Oh, so good. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <clears throat> okay. This is how sh how he's looking mm -hmm. so far. Nice. Mm -hmm. nice. Um. Spe speaking of like um, other things, did did anyone um, like? I want to do a sanity check and check if this was a fever dream that I had. But did anyone notice that Primi 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 Muhammad was basically endorsing some 
AI writing tool? I, that wasn't Premium Muhal on it. That was, um, oh God, uh, S. Ah, SB Divya. Sorry, sorry, yes. sorry. Completely. Yes, SB Divya. Sorry, sorry. I missed it. Yeah, no, Primi Muhammad was not that person. It was yes, not. Sorry. Yes, de definitely. Like, un that was another fever dream. Com completely <laughs> unrelated. Uh, like, no. But yes, SB Divya. Yes. Sorry. Sorry about the confusion. But yeah, they're, they're like, they, they were basically like endorsing some AI writing tool for authors. And uh, why that, would that they did... do that? Yeah, well, that was that 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 whole thing was a shit show. It was the pseudo right thing, basically. Like uh, you, you could you could essentially like insert a prompt and it would spit out like a first draft, so to so to speak. As at least how I understood while when I went and like looked at it, like what it does. And, uh, yeah, I don't know why she was endorsing it. I think like she had worked with the founder before. Yeah. That's that's what I understood. Like, well, well, the whole AI thing like is in her wheelhouse. Like, that's her expertise. Um, in terms of like computer engineering. Um, but like. That that took so many people off guard when when she did that. People were like, "What the was was this F? on Twitter?" Yeah. yeah, it was on Twitter. Yes, Twitter. I have been trying to avoid Twitter, and I thought I had been failing. I thought I was still on Twitter too much, but I haven't seen anything about this drama, so maybe I'm not on Twitter. Too I mean, it was also it was like in April or May. It was. It, it wasn't a super recent one. It like was. In it was week. in late later May. I still saw nothing about this. About about a month ago, but like let's let's put it this way: it it was after our last stitch and bitch, if I remember yeah. correctly, or or like around the time. But to be fair the way twitter is nowadays it doesn't really show you anything that you want to actually see <laughs> so right. you know yeah i am pretty oh. much i'm i'm only using the like following a tab not the for you tab on twitter and oh i mean not... it still showed up on my following tab because a lot of people were discoursing about it mm. yeah. i think i'm not following a lot of people on twitter anymore because most of the people i was following left Oh my God, yes, uh, Mr. Robertson, it was like when those YA authors were promoting like their fictional world NFTs. What? Yeah. I missed this one too. Oh my God, this was like back in like, 2000, like 2021, 2020, like when NFTs were really blowing up. Yeah. And it I'm was several authors, including some what? big names. Like it was Adam, Adam Silvera, Silvera, Marie Lu, um, oh God, the miss the peculiar peculiar children's guy and his ransom wife Riggs. yeah ransom Riggs and um the woman who wrote chatter me because they're married and like oh, maybe oh, it was oh, a thank you and like there might have been a few more but it was like the idea was they would create this like foundational world and people could like write fan fiction create nft tokens and like it might be canon and it was yeah. and people were like <laughs> pointing out how gross this was because nfts are gross but also like the whole like if you write fan fiction it might become real and also it was aimed at teens that too like yeah that's like it, no. was, it was problematic in so many ways that yeah it was can't even can't even begin to count but yeah even i remember this i don't remember this it was i uh... remember it because i had been I, it like soured my opinion on Marie Lu because I had enjoyed some of her stuff, but it made me like not want to touch it. And like between that and Adam Silvera being like really pissy about people who didn't like like Lark, mm. um, because he was one of the people promoting that book, um, because I guess he's friends with Alex Astor, and like people were like didn't like the book, and he was really pissy about it. Um, it made me not want to read his stuff. I mean, the whole thing was that, like, 
when people started criticizing it, like people went on full like defensive mode and like it was it was a shit show in so many different ways. Yep. But also like the funny like one of the funniest part parts of it was that it it like folded over so quickly. Yeah, because like so many people were like, this is a really bad idea. What the fuck are you guys doing? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was quite the scandal. And and especially because of the whole, pre and, and back then people weren't even like, like obviously people were like pointing out the like, unethical stuff about nfts however that was still the early days so people were still like kind of buying into it yeah so like well i feel like i was i think i was because i was following a number of artists a lot of them were very anti-nft yeah um But yeah, it was. Oh, that was that was a day on on book Twitter. Yeah, I have to say I don't miss all the book Twitter controversies. Now that I'm not on it so much, I feel like my blood so, pressure is so a lot better. I feel like I feel like a lot of it has migrated to TikTok. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, there's still has. some book Twitter stuff, but I feel like. TikTok is where a lot of the drama is happening, and I'm not on TikTok, so I miss it. The only I hear about it is like, I, I watch art miss it because I think, <laughs> I think the algorithm knows I don't like drama. It doesn't show me any of it. Or you're not <laughs> interacting with me the, right the Raven Tower is a Hamlet retelling. <laughs> um, or you're not interacting with the right post because the. Generally speaking, the way most of the like for in, in YouTube and TikTok, the way the algorithm actually works is that it will promote uh, more and more like extreme content. The more well, yeah. the more I you mean, start mostly, to browse. Mostly I'm interacting with cat videos and it's showing me more of those, which is fine. Yes. Yeah. But it's like, I, for example, started noticing that um, because I love, watch a lot of like commentary videos on, for example, like LGBT and like LGBT topics and like um, the current like culture war, like panic basically around like the sort of like satanic panic concerning like trans people and stuff like that. And I watch like the... Um, um, Basically, the left takes on those, and YouTube has started to, you know, promote content to me that is on the other side of the spectrum. And I'm like, Thank I do you. not want to see this. Mm -hmm. This is actually quite, um, let's quite disturbing. like, disturbing. That happened to me too a little yeah. bit for a while, and I just like zoned out what YouTube was looking at. I was like, I'm not going to look at anything YouTube is recommending to me until this passes. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've had to start start like basically watching stuff on incognito mode because then I get I, a completely clean slate of like any sort yeah. of recommendations. I get very aggressive with my not interested. Don't show me mm -hmm. this channel on YouTube. Like I find that helps, I and also. Yeah. I highly recommend it. Like sometimes if I'm watching commentary videos, I'll get like something I'm like, this is a right wing rabbit hole. And I'll like, do yeah. not recommend this to me. Like I say, do not recommend it to pretty much all Star Wars commentary because like, well, I love a Star Wars fan vid. I don't, I am not getting involved in the Star Wars YouTube fandom. Like yeah, no. you cannot pay me enough to do that. Um, but also I, I like, I will say I do watch an ad blocker. I, or I do use an ad blocker on YouTube, which helps especially during mm -hmm. political season because oh, yes. I cannot deal with all those fucking ads. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are a certain number of creators whom I will turn the ad block off, but like, 
generally speaking, I I use plugins like Adblog and like basically to like not not watch ads, but also to discourage trackers and various other like stuff. Yeah. And yeah, like it, 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 honestly, a big part of it is like every two years is. A congressional election and i unfortunately live in a district where the republicans will frequently try to target it mm. and i cannot deal with those ads like i would want to it just i see them if i'm watching like live sporting events and it is the worst thing and i don't need that on my youtube mm -hmm. yeah same i mean for me it's also kind of like that that content is honestly kind of, <clears throat> and I'm not using this word lightly, but it's a little bit triggering <laughs> in, in many ways. Oh, so yeah. I, I mm -hmm. definitely try not to watch it or engage with it in any way. But like, yeah, that's that's just like one of those one of those things. Uh, Kelsey, you should be like really happy that you are missing out on all of the drama because that I'm missing means missing out on a lot of drama. Yeah, because that 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 means you're you're not getting like bombarded by the algorithm of all the gross stuff. I'm I'm trying, and it's working, at least partially. Um, do we want to talk about the? Um... So we so we touched upon um, the AI controversy that SB Divya um, got into, and uh, also apologies for apologies for mixing up with Premi Muhammad because I, I was thinking of Premi Muhammad for a completely different reason <laughs> because I have their <laughs> I have their no novellas in my in, in my neon hemlock uh, the uh, what's like. Ostoskori, Jesus Christ. I'm completely blanking on the word. Cart. Ah. Uh, ah. So they, they have been on my mind. Um, I have, but... what, what's, what's that one? And what can we offer you tonight? Mm. I, I need to read that. I, I bought that a little while ago. I am a little sad that it doesn't look like Neon Hemlock is selling their licenses to library, like ebook licenses to libraries. Really? Oh. Yeah, I haven't been able to find them like on Overdrive. Hmm. I mean, I think you could always ask them like what's the deal with that, because their their customer service is really like good about answering questions and stuff. Are we going to touch at all upon the fact that we don't have a Hugo shortlist yet? I was going to. That's what. That's where I was going. I was wondering, <laughs> I was wondering if that was where you were going with I that. I was going there, but then I got sidetracked and the ADHD yeah, I just, took over. I, don't, I have no idea if we're actually going to have a Hugo Awards this year. I mean, I'm still keeping hopeful, but I'm like... I, I it, think we're on track to get something. It's just like... These people cannot stick to a schedule and it, it's like right. <laughs> i think the bigger issue is that their their communication is like not good and right that, and that i think they should like was this communicated at all during during the emails because i haven't received no. a single, single email and i've no. only noticed this because of twitter Yes. So and if you're and not on Twitter, you have no idea what's going on with this. It's just not. They're possibly, someone may also be updating on Facebook. I don't know because I'm not on Facebook. Me but neither. I saw something somewhere that apparently none of this is on Chinese social media either, which I have no way of verifying if that's true or not because I don't know my way around Chinese social media and I can't read Chinese. But by this time in the Worldcon Hugo cycle, you would have gotten multiple emails about progress and deadlines and stuff directly from the con. You would not be relying right. on, am I in the right Facebook group or am I on Twitter? It's just like, <sighs> yeah, 
I'm I'm just a little like I, like I don't know what to even think. I'm like a, I'm like a sli slightly worried that that yeah. I'm I'm slightly worried. Let's put it this way, not not even slightly. I'm just worried. Em emotionally, I'm already in Glasgow, so I'm just <laughs> Yeah, kind of. I'm honestly, I don't know if I should be preparing to do like very quick Hugo reading in large quantities or not cuz like I don't I don't even know if we can expect any sort of Hugo voter packet this year. It That's feels the like something they're yeah. not going to manage. Yeah, I'm I have no There's no, no idea. way they're going to get that done in time for people to no. be able to read. read stuff. I mean, even in past conventions that have been on top of it, they've had, you know, it's been a while to get the voter packet or they've had to update it multiple times after they announce it. So, yeah. So I would be shocked if we if we actually get a timely voter packet and so then like if I read any of the stuff will depend hugely on what's on the the short list and if I already own any of it. And if you have yeah, like a big ready. thing is do I own it? Can I easily get it from the library? Mm -hmm. Right. Have I read it? Yeah, have I read it already? And like, I am losing any sort of hope that there will be enough time that if there's like Chinese language short fiction that hasn't been translated, that someone would translate that in time for English language readers or anything. Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a little worried, yeah. So I don't know whether to like just, you know, make my plans for what I want to read in, in July and like screw the Hugo reading or if I should be blocking off my entire July for Hugo reading. I am like at this point, my July is try, like, I'm going to try and read some of the Dandelion Dynasty because I'm pretty sure that's going to get a best series nom and I have two yeah. books left and those things are chonky monsters. But yeah, also, same. I mean, I'm I like, should also get on that. But also, I am running out of room on my bookshelf. So what I've decided to do is do one of those read or unhaul blogs. And I've pulled like a Ooh. bunch of YA books that I've accumulated over the last few years. And I'm going to do the thing where you like read a few chapters. And like, if you want to continue, read until you either finish or DNF. And anything that you don't feel an interest in reading, you get rid of. Because like, I need to clear some shelf space. It's getting ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the thing I want to see is whether the Golden Enclaves makes it to the Lord Star. Oh my god, I'm gonna be so mad. Because then I them. will implode internally. You will just hear a scream from the side of Southern Finland. All of us, every single one of us will <laughs> implode on a live stream for you. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can we can just insert the uh uh like the Obi Wan from the New Hope. I felt a huge disturbance in the force, <laughs> like, <laughs> like a million voices suddenly cried in unison. No, not and we're silent. <laughs> Do you think it'll be nominated for best series too? Because I mean, it's it's over, right? I think it will be. Yeah. Oh, I mean, for best Here's series, the thing. I could like, understand it, like. Naomi Novik is I a Hugo think. darling. Like, she's a Hugo darling. It's going to be there. It's just, it's so frustrating because, like, if they were going to vote for a Hugo darling for the Lodestar, I wish they would would have voted for Charlie Jane Anders because she's actually writing YA. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, we, we shall see how, how this will how this will develop, whether we will have a Hugo shortlist at all. And uh, how is that going to look like? At, See, at this point, I'm probably I, not going to plan on doing much reading for the Hugos. <laughs> that would be, like, ultimately the, the, the healthiest thing for my peace of mind for me to take that route and not really read for the Hugos this year because... There is so much that I really want to read and, like, I want to take advantage of you know, I do, I've talked about this before, my counter seasonal reading, 
where the yes. summer months are the only months when I really feel up to heavier books. And so like I have, you know, some heavier fantasy and science fiction, some like darker stuff, some spookier stuff, some like denser stuff that I really want to read. And I have I to do it for it. Do some, do some happy mood reading and, I think that usually helps with, you know, getting some motivation to read other things for a deadline, too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, it was so interesting to me when I, I read Witch King as soon as it arrived. And it was like a dense book, but it was sort of the thing I've flown through fastest recently. Mm -hmm. It's because... I like the the dense stuff works for me in the summer. I think. I mean, like it's and like why this. I like I'm reading. taking forever to read, even though it's a fluffy romance. Well, not not fluffy. See, fluffy. I like reading winter books in summer because it, like, it's the same reason I used to watch like the the um, stop motion Christmas specials in the summer because it makes me feel cold. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so like Spinning Silver, if I reread it, I reread it in the summer. See, the reason yeah, I, will I say that winter books in the summer is because I literally can't read them in the winter. I pick them up and I'm like, nope, too cold. And um, so I know that I have to read them in the summer if I'm going to get them off my TBR at all. I mean, I kind of feel the same way with the um, currently that I'm, I'm picking up the Robin Hobb again. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna sneeze. Um, that they like something about them. They feel they feel too daunting and tragic, and and like everything that is anti-summer, sort of. And during this like like horrible heat waves, I kind of need the anti-summer. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, um, we are almost, um, f nearing our two hour mark in, in about like what, 15 minutes or so. So yeah. do we want to start wrapping it up a little bit? Does anyone have anything that they want to some, some newsworthy stuff relating to media or reading or publishing that they want to share at this point? I will have an anticipated releases for the second half of the year coming on my channel sometime in the next few days. I have to film it, but I've got it mostly prepared. So I will, I think, refer people to, to that upcoming video from me if you want to see what my anticipated releases will be for the second half of the year that will be my next video on my channel got it die or rachel and do you have anything um coming up? i have a, i have a wrap-up that i filmed that i need to edit i just i ran into some editing problems where the, it didn't import right and i lost like an hour's worth of work um and i was really frustrated and didn't want to redo it um and then i have uh, unpopular opinions tag and probably doing a mid-year book freakout tag. Ooh. Oh, I actually think that I'm I might be willing to try and crawl back from my hiatus with a with a book book mid-year book freakout tag because like that way I wouldn't have to necessarily do like the million wrap-ups. I could just yeah, like, that, talk I think a that little would... bit hit the highlights, yeah. Yeah, get yeah, the highlight and... real. Also, um, Mr. Rarasuri, I'm also looking forward to the archive on dying. That one, yes, uh, I have a hold on it at my library. And I'm also, let's see, I'm trying to think what what things I can <gasps> recommend. Um, I know Elizabeth Acevedo has an ab an adult book coming out um, this she year. Has? I think, 
What? I a bookmarked. I don't know anything about it yet. She has. It, it sounds good, and I really loved "Clap When You Land." So I, I asked the library everything to... by Elizabeth Acevedo that I've read. So I, I've asked the library to get that. Um, let's see. Um, trying to see what other things. Oh, uh, Valerie Valdez has a new book coming out called Where Peace is Lost that sounds good. That's also coming out in August. Nice. So soon. I thought it was coming out at the end of the year. One thing, by LAPL the way. LAPL saying that it's expected hmm. August 28th. One thing I realized that we have not covered yet that also happened just around the time last month that we had our last stitch and bitch. And that is Amazon closing book depository. Oh yeah. That happened. Yeah. That happened. That happened. And that was horrible. Too much. I, I heard about it a couple of days before their deadline. Yeah. I mostly switched to Blackwell's for my UK ordering, but it's like everything's gone now. Like I had a massive like curated wish list on book depository Same. and I didn't get a chance to capture any I mean I hadn't been ordering from them for for a long time because they're Amazon and I didn't want to give them money but like Same. that sucks especially for people in countries that don't have other other places that will ship international yeah. editions to them I mean for for my for what it's worth for my book buying it hasn't really like because I can order stuff from Ad Libris which is like the and, and they have a lot of like English titles and stuff like that. Uh, and it's a Nordic basically bookseller. However, it's like adds like something like 10 to 15% to all of the book prices. Mm -hmm. So it's more expensive. But the thing that really rubs my gears the wrong way is that Book Depository was basically my go to place to get manga at like relatively reasonable prices compared to like how I have to get it now. Um, and uh, that kind of sucks. I, I had hopes to get like the hardcover editions of Full Metal Alchemist and like Berserk for like the 30 to 35 euro price range. Whereas now, if I have to buy them from like a Finnish retailer, it will be like 50 to 55 euros. So, Ooh. so yeah, that's that's gonna be fun. But I knew, I knew Amazon was gonna pull this. Like, the, the moment they bought Book Depository, the writing was on the wall. They shut down Fabric.com, too. Saw yeah. that one coming. So pissed about that. Yeah. <sighs> Friggin' Amazon. Mm -hmm. They suck. Suck so much. But yeah, at this stage, I'm 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 not gonna promise videos, but I uh, may maybe I will make a book, like a freakout booktube tag. I did a a mid year tag on TikTok, so I'm not doing one on YouTube this year. Um, but hold on. My sewing. It's taking um, shape. Slightly ooh, more cute. animal shape. Nice. <laughs> I might get most of the body done today. Yeah, Ramsey, I hate that about Amazon, how they just buy places Absolutely. and kill them off. Now, is yeah, Comixology actually dead, or are they trying to integrate it into the Amazon platform? Because I was trying to figure that out the other day. I was trying to well, um, so what they Bride's yeah, Tale. They, I think at this point it's basically dead. Yeah. Okay. They just use the name for whatever they're they're doing. I mean, they're definitely not going to let the domains go. Mhm. Mm because, you know, that's just bad practicum that that would allow people to like host uh not only scams but like other like services. So they're they're definitely like even if they're shutting down the platforms, they're not going to release the domains. And most likely the workers who have been working for Book Depository have some sort of non-competition non clause in their contract, so they can't start up another book business. Mm -hmm. So that's how I think it's going to go.
So here is the final puck, I guess. I'm probably gonna color him in at some point. Nice. But here he nice. is. And uh, a moment of silence for Book Depository. That was like my go-to place for many years. And uh, next month, I think we are, are we on Dice or Kelsey's channel or? Mine, I think. Yeah, because mine was in April, so yeah. I would be August. Yes. All right. So we, we will be on Kelsey's channel and we, will, we shall let you know about the schedule in, in, uh, in places. Yeah, and there, there may, like, if we ever get a short list, there may be a reaction live show. But Yeah, uh, I think we still want to do that if we can. It's going to depend on Chengdu, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's going to depend on, like, when they actually give it to yeah. us. Yeah, I'm hoping Chengdu will. I, I have faith, but it's like it's it's a tiny minuscule faith that is easily stomped out. So Well, at least they moved the actual convention to October, so like we have a little bit more time, but still Yeah, but who thinks the convention is actually gonna happen? I still don't think that their uh convention center is built. Yeah, that, that is a that is a problem. I have not heard any updates on that. And you don't one. really want to hold a large convention in a shoddy center that got you know the construction rushed. So, um, I mean, it worked for FIFA. Uh, those who know know. <laughs> Based on Dai's facial expression, Dai was like, mm, "Yes." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yes, I am. I am well aware of FIFA's many sins. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> the sins that they are never ending. <laughs> the list goes on. It's like it's. You know that office meme where it's like it's been zero days since the last our, our last nonsense. That's how I feel with FIFA candles. It's been yeah. zero days since the last FIFA nonsense. Oh. Yeah, zero days since last incident. Okay. Well, um, our time is coming to an end. So uh, where can everyone find you? Uh, let's start with Rachel. Uh, well, you can find me in the Stitch and Bitch live shows. Um, that's pretty much my only consistent YouTube thing right now. And on Instagram is Kalanati. Uh Kelsey? I'm the fancy hat lady reads. I'm on um, BookTube, BookTok. It, Twitter, but not very much these days, mostly just for video and Goodreads updates. Um, and I'm on Mastodon as well. Die? Uh, you can find me at Bookish Die on Twitter because I'm going, I'm staying as long as I can, <laughs> and uh, YouTube, and that's mostly where you can find me. Yes, and you can find me at YouTube and Twitter under the name The Bookfinch, uh, though I am very... I'm, I'm in lurker mode right now. I'm gathering the necessary social energy to put myself out there. So most consistently, as with Rachel, you will find me on these Stitch and Bitch live streams for now. Um, and uh, yeah, with that said, uh, I wish you a very happy... Uh, rest of June and a very happy rest of your weekend wherever you are and uh, we will see you next time. Bye bye! Bye! bye.